So hi, I'm Dr. Kathy Harper and I teach at Ohio State and I'm here to talk to you today about how a lot of the basic things that you already know about how to analyze circuits apply to RC circuits. And so let's get started. So I'm going to just very briefly give you a few examples of why we have RC circuits at all and then get into the kinds of questions that we tend to ask, particularly in physics too, about RC circuits, and then spend a fair amount of time with an example showing you how to apply some of these basic analysis tools to RC circuits. So, right, RC circuits are not some device that was just made up to give you more questions to answer in physics class. It turns out that resistors and capacitors in combination are used by electrical engineers for so many devices all around you. And here are just a few examples of these. These are basically applications where we need to be able to control the period of something, or we need to be able to release a burst of charge instead of a steady stream. So some examples of things where the RC circuit it controls the period would be something like a blinking light on a traffic barricade or if you have your windshield wipers on intermittent those controls basically are RC circuits. Um, an old-fashioned camera flash is an example of how we use the capacitor to store up some charge and then release it in a burst and every audio speaker around you has RC components in it as well. So typically when you're asked an RC circuit question you're asked about one of two situations, or sometimes the two of them in combination. But we can think about the charging of a capacitor. So a battery charges a capacitor and there'll be a resistor there in the circuit as well. Or the capacitor is discharging through some kind of resistor network. And um, sometimes it's the same circuit. Sometimes we ask you about just one in one situation. But no matter what we ask you, the important thing to remember is that the physics is the same. So whether you have a charging capacitor or a discharging capacitor, physics hasn't changed. You're gonna use exactly the same basic principles of physics to analyze the situation. So let's take a look at a very basic RC circuit, right? So we have a battery, a couple of resistors, and a capacitor there with a switch. So when that switch is thrown to the left and connects so that we make a loop there on the left with the battery, the resistor, and the capacitor, the capacitor can charge, right? The battery charges the capacitor. If we throw that switch to the right so that we have a closed loop with just the capacitor and the resistor in it, if the capacitor has some charge on it when that switch is thrown, then the capacitor will discharge through the resistor. So those are our two basic situations. And you will see circuits that have more resistors or possibly more capacitors or maybe even more batteries. But basically it all boils down to this. We're gonna focus on some fairly simple examples, but also talk about how these tools will apply to more complex circuits as you go along. So I've been talking about basic analysis techniques. And so what do I mean by that? What things do you already know that apply here? All right, so what basic analysis techniques uh, do I mean that you've already been using? So first and foremost, we have Ohm's law. You've seen that for a long time. And what that just says is that if we have a resistor, the potential difference across that resistor divided by its resistance tells us what the current is in that location in the circuit. We add to that something that's probably a little bit newer to you, and that is the definition of capacitance, right? And what that is, is that the capacitance of a capacitor is the magnitude of the charge stored on one plate of the capacitor divided by the potential difference between those plates. And that's all the capacitance is. And that definition is going to help us analyze what's going on in the circuit when the capacitor is present. And then we have Kirchhoff's laws. And you may have learned them as Kirchhoff's voltage law and Kirchhoff's uh, current law. You might have learned them as the junction rule and the loop rule, whatever you call them, right? You should recognize this physics here. And so the junction rule tells us that if we have a junction in a circuit, the amount of current that goes into that junction is equal to the amount that comes out. So just because we had some wires meet up in a circuit, right? We don't spontaneously create or destroy charge. We just gave them different paths to go through. So what comes in? must go out. 
And then we have the loop rule or the potential difference rule, which says that for any closed path that we can take around a loop in a circuit, if we add up all the potential differences around that loop, when we get back to where we started, that sum must be equal to zero. And remember that there's a sign convention that goes along with this. So if we're going around the loop in a direction that we go from the negative to the positive terminal of the battery, that is considered to be a positive potential difference. If we're going the opposite direction, it would be negative. With the other elements in the circuit, so the resistors and the capacitors, if we're going around the loop in a direction that we're going the same direction as the current when we get to that element, then those voltage contributions, those potential difference contributions are negative. If we're going around the loop in a direction opposing the current at that location, then the contributions of potential difference from those elements would be positive. So here is the most basic charging situation that we can have. We have a battery, we have a resistor, and we have a capacitor. So if we take this picture while the capacitor is in the process of being charged, at any time while it is charging, it will be true that the current is equal to the potential difference of the resistor divided by its resistance, and that the charge on a capacitor plate will be equal to its capacitance times the potential difference between its plates. These two things will always be true, no matter how much current there is, no matter what the charge on the capacitor plate is. And it's always true for all the loops in any circuit, as we just talked about, that the sum of the potential differences has to be equal to zero. In this case, we only have one loop. So we know that following our sign conventions, if we add up the potential differences of the battery the resistor and the capacitor going around the loop in the same direction that we will get a sum of zero. So if we take a moment and we look at the very first instant that the capacitor is in this circuit. So if the capacitor is initially uncharged and we have just thrown the switch to start it charging at that very moment, because the capacitor has no charge on it yet, right? there is no potential difference between the capacitor plates. So if the capacitor was uncharged, it's put into the circuit, we throw the switch, there's no charge on the capacitor yet, therefore there is no potential difference between the capacitor plates. We also know that because the potential differences around the loop add up to zero and there's no potential difference of the capacitor, that the magnitude of the potential difference across the resistor has to be equal to the magnitude of the potential difference of the battery. And so looking at that math there, that tells us that the potential difference of the battery is equal and opposite to the potential difference across the resistor. And so that also means that the magnitude of the circuit's current has to be the potential difference of either the resistor or the battery, because they're the same thing, divided by the resistance. And this is the maximum value of the current during the charging because as the capacitor starts to charge, Q will no longer be zero. The, so the charge on the capacitor plates increases in magnitude. The potential difference between the capacitor plates increases. That means the potential difference for the resistor has to decrease. And that means that the current has to decrease. Now, Another way of thinking about this is with more of a visual. So I want to show you one of my favorite analysis tricks to use with looking at these kinds of circuits and I share it with all of my students. And to be completely honest, whenever I tell my students about this and I show it to them in class, a lot of them roll their eyes at me because this looks so simple on the surface that it almost seems like it couldn't possibly be helpful or it couldn't possibly be necessary. But the truth is, later on in the term, when students come to my office and they ask me questions about circuits, the first question I ask them is, have you tried the trick that I showed you? And then they roll their eyes at me again. And I say, no, no, you really need to do this before I'm gonna answer your questions. And pretty much 95% of the time, the student will follow my advice, employ this trick that I'm going to show you. And then they look at me and they say, oh, I don't need to ask you my question anymore because I figured out the answer myself. So that's why I wanna show you this trick. So 
the trick is all about visualizing the potential difference uh, in the circuits, visualizing what the potential is like all through the circuit. So let's take a look at the part of the circuit where um, the battery goes to the resistor. So we have the positive terminal of the battery there. And because we're dealing with ideal circuits, that means that the potential difference will not change in the wire. The only place, the potential will not change in the wire. So the only time that the potential can change is when we encounter a circuit element. So a battery, a resistor, a capacitor. So if I think about this, that means that that positive plate of the battery has to be at the same value of potential as all of that wire that connects it to the resistor. And so what I can do is I can color this all the same color to remind me that all of that is at the same value of potential. Doesn't matter what color I pick, I happen to pick a, a light purple because I like it. And now similarly, the wire that connects the resistor to the top plate of the capacitor, all of that, including the top plate of the capacitor, will be at the same potential different, same value of the potential, which is different than the pink one. So I'll color it a different color. I've picked orange. And then finally, the bottom plate of the capacitor, the negative terminal of the battery, and all of the wire that connects them as is at a third value of the potential, and I'll color it blue. Right? So this shows me that I have three different values of potential in this circuit. It shows me where the differences in potential are, right? So I have three potential differences, potentially. One across the battery, one across the resistor, and one between the plates of the capacitor. So now, if I use this, this can help me to analyze how those potential differences exist in the circuit and as the charge on the capacitor changes and the current changes, how those potential differences might change. So while we're charging, this is what it would look like. And let's talk about what this means for the charging. So as the magnitude of charge on the capacitor plates increases, that means the potential difference increases between the capacitor plates, right? The charge gets bigger, so does the potential difference. So the difference between whatever numbers are represented by blue and orange is getting bigger as time goes on, getting greater as time goes on. That means because of the loop rule, again, that the potential difference across the resistor has to decrease. So the orange and the pink value are now closer together than they were. So the value of the orange is changing. It is becoming less blue and more like pink. And the current decreases, right? Because if the potential difference across the resistor is decreasing and its resistance stays the same, then the current must decrease. And it's really important to point out here that these three things are consistent with each other, right? If one of these things happen, the other two things have to happen. It's not that one of them happens and then the other two happen later. They all happen together at the same time because they're all different consequences of the same action of the charge moving in the circuit. So now when the capacitor is fully charged, the potential difference of the capacitor is the same as the potential difference of the battery. And we see that represented in our colors here. It is also the case now that there's no current in the circuit. So there is no potential difference across the resistor. And we see that because all of the resistor is the same color in our representation here. Right, and that just says that here. And that says that. All right, take a moment and think about that. And then we'll start to think about what other things happen in RC circuits. So if we look at discharging, the circuit looks a little bit simpler. There's only two things in it, the capacitor and the resistor. And at any time, these things will be true. The current, as we have said many times before, has to be equal to the potential difference of the resistor divided by its resistance. And the charge on the capacitor is the capacitance times its potential difference between its plates. So just like before, these things are always true.
right? And we can color code the circuit and see that we have the same potential difference in magnitude across each of these elements. So if I go around that loop, when I go across one of the elements, the potential difference will go up by a certain amount, or the potential will go up by a certain amount. When I go across the other element, it will drop by that much. So focusing on the beginning and end of the discharging process, and one of the reasons that I'm focusing on the beginning and the end of both the charging and discharging here is because those are the kinds of questions we tend to ask in physics too. It turns out there's a number of questions that we could ask about what's happening during the charging that are not all that hard to answer, but we tend to not ask those in physics too so much. So let's focus on the beginning and ending of discharging. So when the discharge starts, the charge on the capacitor is at the maximum value it will be for the situation, and the current is also at its maximum. And then when the discharge ends, well, it ends because there is no longer any excess charge on either plate of the capacitor. And since there's no charge to leave the capacitor, there is no current that represents the charge leaving. So that also means that since there is no current, there is no potential difference across the resistor. Since there is no charge on the capacitor, there is no potential difference across the capacitor. And notice that that is exactly consistent with what the loop law tells us, that if one of them has a zero potential difference, the other one has to have a zero potential difference, so that when we add up all of our potential differences around the circuit, they add up to zero. All right, so I've been talking about color coding the, the circuit a lot. And you might be saying, well, okay, that's nice, but I don't have colored pencils, I don't have highlighters, I don't wanna have them all on my desk while I'm taking a test and have them roll all over the floor, that is fine. Um, so there's a way that you can do it without color. And that is you could make little patterns, okay? So basically these two circuits are telling me the same thing. So instead of using pink, as I did on the left, in the circuit on the right, I'm using little polka dots next to the wire to show that all of that is at the same potential. And then instead of orange, I drew little cross hatches through that part of the circuit. And then um, for the blue, I did a little curly Q thing. So some kind of pattern. So you don't have to have color. I think the color looks a little cleaner and I like color and I enjoy it, but if you would rather do some kind of notation in black and white, that is just fine and it will give you the same information. So now, Let's take a look at an example problem. So here's something a little bit more complicated than when we looked at before. We have a battery, three resistors, and a capacitor that are arranged as you can see there, and we have a switch. And so let's focus on the charging part because that's the part that uh, is a little bit more um, meaty, I guess, to take a look at. So if I close the switch, and start charging the capacitor, right? At some random time while it's charging, if I, again, get out my colored pencils and I color code the circuit, I see that I have these four different values of potential in the circuit. Now, let's think about what happens as the capacitor charges. Which of those colors are going to change in their value? Which of them are going to stay the same? Well, the pink and the orange will stay the same because a battery's job is to keep a constant potential difference, right? And if you even think about it, the way that we describe batteries often tells you how many volts, right? We talk about nine volt batteries all the time. So the bat a nine volt battery's job is to maintain nine volts of potential difference between its terminals. In this case, it's a five volt battery. So the difference between pink and orange will always be five volts, no matter what else happens in the circuit. Now, Let's look at what happens when the capacitor becomes fully charged and answer some questions, all right? So after a long time, which again is code for when the capacitor is fully charged in these questions, we wanna know what are the currents and the potential differences associated with each resistor in the circuit, all right? So think for a moment about what it means for the capacitor to be fully charged and what effect that might have on other parts of the circuit. And so if we think about that, right, that means that there will be no current in its branch of the circuit because there's no charge coming to or leaving from the capacitor, right? So if we take this diagram that we just had and we adjust it for when the capacitor is fully charged, what that means is there's no current 
through the three ohm resistor. So there is no potential difference across the three ohm resistor. And so now that red section has become orange. And we see that we are now working with three values of potential in our circuit. So let's take a look at this and let's figure out those values. So the first part is, I kind of said some of this already, that since the three ohm resistor has no current through it, it also has no potential difference across it. So we're done with that one. That was nice. That was hopefully easy. But we do have potential differences across both the 2 ohm and the 8 ohm resistors. So we will have currents there. And so let's figure out the values of those potential differences and the values of the current there. So if there's no current in the right hand loop of the circuit, the right hand branch of the circuit, we can simplify it to focus in on the 2 and 8 ohm resistors. Right? So it's effectively just a single loop once the capacitor has fully been charged. And so we have a 5 volt battery and a 2 and an 8 ohm resistor. And hopefully this kind of structure looks familiar to you. We can use equivalent resistance and see that this is really the same as a 5 volt battery and a 10 ohm resistor. And with that, we can find out that the current is half an amp. So it's half an amp in each of the 2 ohm and the 8 ohm resistors. And now with that information, we can go back to the first circuit, the first circuit on this slide, okay, the 2 ohm and 8 ohm situation and figure out what their potential differences are. So if we go back and take a look at that and we rem remember that the current there is half an amp, all we have to do is use Ohm's law and find that the potential difference for the 2 ohm resistor is one volt and for the 8 ohm resistor, it's four volts. Right? And if we wanted to, it's always a good idea to check your work when you can. Again, physics is always consistent with itself. You can check with Kirchhoff's loop rule. So do all of your potential differences when you go around the loop and obey the sign conventions add up to zero. And we find that indeed they do. So if I go around the loop clockwise and I start at the battery, I will have um, an increase of five volts as I go across the battery, drop one volt going across the two ohm, drop four volts going across the eight ohm, and that adds up to zero. Voila. Now, let's take a look at the capacitor. So what's going on with the capacitor? Here it is again in the circuit, so you can remember what's happening. So we know the currents and the potential differences for all of the resistors. And is there anything about that that can help us figure out what's going on with the capacitor? And here's where the color coding can really help. If we take a look at this, we see that both the 8 ohm resistor and the capacitor have the same potential difference. They both have this difference that we've symbolized here as being the difference between orange and blue. And that means that since I know the potential difference of the 8 ohm resistor, I also know the potential difference of the capacitor. All right, and if you remember from our previous slide, we found out that that was four ohms, or four volts, sorry. And because I know the potential difference between the capacitor plates and I know its capacitance, it's a short calculation to figure out how much charge is on the capacitor, which is a common thing that we ask in these situations. And that charge is just what I said. And when we put in the numbers, it comes out to be 16 microcoulombs. Right? And if you wanted to, I'm not going to do it here, you can double check everything that I just showed you by applying the loop rule to the outer loop of the circuit or to the right hand loop of the circuit. Everywhere in physics, there are opportunities for you to double check your work to look for consistency between different ways of approaching the problem. But circuits is one place where it is um, almost, almost usually the easiest to find a different way of analyzing the circuit and see if you get the same answer or not. Again, physics is always consistent with itself. So to summarize what I talked about here today, RC circuits really are in pretty much every electronic device around you. Okay, And those same tools that were introduced to you when you started analyzing networks of resistors work when we add capacitors to the mix.
One thing I didn't say earlier that's important to remember is this color coding of the circuits is amazingly helpful whenever you have some of those problems that have lots and lots of resistors in a network because it helps you to more easily identify with confidence what elements are really in parallel with each other and which ones are in series with each other, right? As I've said many times today, physics is consistent. You should always be able to find a way in a circuit problem to check your work. And absolutely, don't be afraid or too proud or whatever it is to get out those colored pencils or those highlighters or those crayons, whatever you have with color, and use them to color code your circuit to make the analysis easier on yourself. So with that, thanks very much for your time. Good luck with physics and all of your courses this year. And just good luck with all of your schoolwork. Thank you.